Welcome to the Exam Room Podcast, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hello, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for watching and downloading in more than 150 countries around the world and making the Exam Room one of the most consumed nutrition podcasts on the planet. You know, here in the United States, one of the things that we love to consume the most is red meat. We are just obsessed with meat in our diet because the more eat, the more meat you eat, the more protein you get. And boy, do we ever have a protein obsession too. But today, we're also going to be talking about why you're going to want to like really get that red meat out of your diet, the risks that are associated with it, and the five tips that we have for you that you can use to take the red meat out of your diet, start eating a healthier diet today. And with that, we welcome for the very first time a fresh face to the exam room. She is a registered dietitian. She is my new colleague here at the Physicians Committee. She is our nutrition educator. She spent five years in the Navy. She's a food for life instructor. She's a wonderful human being. Steph McBurnett, registered dietitian. Welcome to the exam room. Hi, thank you so much, Chuck. I am very excited to be here. I'm thrilled that you're here. I'm thrilled to have uh, some some new colleagues among us. I'm like really excited to work with you because I know just in the you know few times that we've interacted, your creativity is off the charts. And I really think that you're going to have some fun and creative ways to really hit the roomies with a whole lot of knowledge. Yes, I know every everybody's different in how they approach reducing meat. And I just find that um, having fun with it is also great because it's not about taking things out and feeling bad about it and being stressed. It's about having fun and everything that you're gaining from reducing your meat intake. And I don't know how much red meat the average person consumes over the course of a year, but I'm sure that it's a lot. Obviously, if you're watching this show, you're probably eating a plant-based diet. So this is something that you're going to want to share with your friends and your family who you really want to help raise their health IQ. Um, by and large, in that standard American diet, I mean, we, we really are just like drowning in steaks and hamburgers and things like that, aren't we? Yes. Yeah, so the average American is eating meat multiple times a day. I mean, if it's not bacon for breakfast, chicken salad for lunch, and then steak for dinner, they're getting three times a day, this kind of boom, 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 um, in, uh, inflammation increase into their body. And it's, it's overload of protein. I know that everyone's obsessed with protein, but your kidneys, it, it really does uh, take its toll on your kidneys especially as you age. So we want to be careful with how much um, meat we're, we're intaking. Yep. You know what? I just consulted Dr. Google here. Uh, I got to, you know, don't take this as the gospel, but it says 55 pounds of beef annually for the average American. That's, that's a lot of beef. You don't have to ask where the beef is when you're talking about 55 pounds per person. Uh, that obviously, though, comes with a really big increased risk for a lot of chronic diseases cancer being chief among them, wouldn't you say? Yes. Yeah, so I actually was just talking to someone about this the other day. Red meat intake, um, it increases your heart disease, your type 2 diabetes risk, your kidney disease risk, colon cancer, prostate cancer. I mean, it actually is a little bit overwhelming and a little bit scary. The studies that just keep building and mounting up that say, you know, just one serving of red meat a day increases your mortality by 12%. I mean, that is, these are kind of wild um, numbers. And I, now I know why, you know, people are starting to get on board. They're starting to do the meatless Mondays. And, you know, we're, we're seeing, we're, we're seeing why all these studies are coming out. So um, they're all floating to the surface. They've been around for a while, but they're just now starting to gain some traction. All right. So now let's give the good people some tips for getting that red meat out of their diet. Not exactly the easiest thing for a lot of us to give up. I think it's probably second only to cheese. Like when I say, well, why couldn't you eat a plant-based diet? It's always, well, uh, I just can't give up my cheese or I really love my cheese burger or that mm -hmm. steak. So let's go ahead and go through some of these tips. What is your first tip for getting that red meat out of a person's diet? Yes. Yeah, so um, with with any diet change, you know, people are it's ingrained in them to eat meat every day. I mean, 
as we see the dietary guidelines have protein and meat as the number one source. So I get that it is hard. So I wanted to kind of mix it up and have different techniques. Everyone has a different relationship with food and different relationship with cooking. So I kind of mix it up to have different ways to kind of do this. Number one, I want to, call, I call the easy drop. Right. So as a dietitian, I've looked at hundreds of diet recalls of food diaries and really everyone eats pretty much that they, they're all eating the same things. You know, breakfast, maybe two different options, lunch, maybe two to three different options that occasional going out to eat and getting something different dinner, about seven different options. People kind of will float through, but people are eating the same thing. So the easy drop look at what you're already doing. You don't have to change anything. Look at your menu. Look at what you're eating for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and just see where you have spaghetti and meatballs. Drop the meatballs and just see how that goes, right? You have beef and bean burritos. Take out the beef. See how that goes. And so this is really about making it as easy as possible and then trying to, once you're getting used to taking meat out of your diet more and more and more, you can start adding in different options. You start looking at different recipes, but really my number one, the easy drop. I love the way that that's freight, the easy drop. And it, it really is when you look at it in that regard, right? You just take it out, you know, the one thing that easy drop, it makes it somehow more palatable as opposed to this daunting task of taking all of it out mm -hmm. of your diet at one time, which I think causes a lot of people just to put their guard up initially. But if you're talking about making a small change like that, it can lead to a bigger change down the line. So good tip number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, I love the way that you phrased this one as well. The crowd out. What What is the crowd out? So the crowd out, I kind of created, or I liked, or you could even say like the box out, right? If you're going with basketball, boxing out yep. is more for those individuals that have a family or have a family member who are not on board. So what you really want to do is bulk up the other items on your plate. So bulk up the veggies, bulk up the brown rice and really, really reduce that meat on your plate. So let's say you have a family who's not hundred percent on board, but you buy half the amount of meat you used to. And so maybe for you, you don't put any on your plate, but for your family, you're putting smaller amounts and you're just you're kind of bulking up the rest. So you're kind of crowding out that meat. Or this also could be used for someone who really loves that flavor of meat. So what you do is you take, you know, chicken and you slice it up and you're crumbling it or your, your steak and you're really cutting into tiny, tiny pieces. You're only using about one ounce maybe. And then you sprinkle that on your veggies or sprinkle that on your plate to still get that flavor. But you are really, really reducing the amount of overall meat. So maybe instead of buying four steaks for the week, you're buying only one and, and kind of sectioning it out. So this makes it more palatable for families to kind of start to move towards reducing the meat intake. So the crowd out then leads to the next basketball analogy, which is the fade away. Is this mm -hmm. the natural progression? Is this going where I think it might be? Well, so the fade away is what I did when I kind of decided to do um, plant based. It's really looking at your diet and saying, OK, how many times a day am I eating meat? OK, so let's say you're eating two to three times a day. Let's bring that down to one. Right. Or let's even see, are you eating processed and red meat? Let's cut out processed meat and then stick with the red meat and then moving that to only one time a day. Right. And then from there, you're going um every other day. So once you get comfortable, so you're starting to make these non meat centric meals, but you're doing it in a very slow way where you don't feel stressed. Maybe you're picking one to two days a week and you're doing, oh, I'm going to try this new falafel recipe, or I'm going to do this new pasta recipe that doesn't have meat. So really you're, you're sectioning now. It's almost like a meatless Monday, but it, it does go in a progression. So as you feel comfortable with three days with no meat, then you go four days, then maybe during the week, you're not eating meat, but on the weekends, you know, you might have one meal. And then you finally get to the point where you're not buying it in your home. But let's say you go to a friend's house and 
you're partaking in some of the meat or if you go to a wedding or if you're going to a special event and you're you're partaking in that meat but in your house you don't have any more so that is this is a way to still reduce your meat you're still doing great your body is thanking you and then eventually like me i got to the point where I was very comfortable with myself. I could go to a party and bring, either bring my own stuff or really say no to anything that involved um, animal products, go to a wedding and I can talk with the chef or just kind of eat around and just know that I'm here for the wedding. I'm not here for the food. So the fade away is that slow, steady, trying to keep it as low stress as possible of reducing meat in your diet. With the people whom you've worked with, it, have you found that when they do make this big change to their diet, it's easier for them to do when there is this gradual progression that that fade away? Because I know that there's also a lot of exam roomies who feel like, well, the change needs to happen and it needs to happen like this instant. And I think that that can be really jarring for a lot of people. Yes. So it's all personality driven. I think there are some people like my husband who the next day he was, he was done. And actually number five technique is this, um, we'll get to it. Well, yeah, we'll get is, to it. We'll get to okay. it. We, we, we don't need to jump the line here. Okay. I may have, I may have, uh, led us a little bit too far down the, the down the discussion here. Nope. It's, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> but yeah. So number four is I call the replacements, right? So we really want to look at the top kind of five replacements and you can do your own research, take the time, really experiment. So there's beans and lentils. So kind of try all the different types of beans. You know, you're kind of just looking at what you like. And then there's tofu and tempeh, which really is just uh, blended and pressed together soybeans. Then there's mushrooms is a main alternative that people go to. There is wheat gluten or seitan, which really was you're just pulling the protein out of wheat and it kind of gets spongy and that's all it is. It's just protein that's in wheat. Um, very high in protein if you are looking to increase your protein intake. And then we have the meat alternatives that are at the grocery store. So you have things like Impossible Burger, Beyond Meat, but then you do have Gardein. You have Dr. Prager's kind of be bean patties. So you kind of want to try all those out. And my recommendation is to find three to four that you love, that you will eat no matter what. You know, in my house, it's black beans. I can get my kids to always eat black beans, chickpeas, um, and then Dr. Prager's bean patties. It's actually the quinoa and black bean. We keep those in the freezer. We have you know, in bulk, we have all these beans. Oh, and tofu. We buy tofu at Costco. I would say my family has tofu at least once a day. So we have found what our favorites are. So when we are stressed, when we're rushing around with kids activities that we go, OK, well, I know I have a can of black beans downstairs. I have some, um, you know, some vegetables in the freezer. Let's whip together some brown rice vegetables and black beans, you know, so the replacements are really finding out what you like. You don't have to like every type of bean. The best bean is the one that you'll actually eat. So this is kind of um, just kind of one technique or kind of one way of going about it is finding what you love and then always having that on the ready. Oh man, you know, that is just perhaps the best piece of advice that has ever been uttered here on the show. Find what works for you. Mm -hmm. If you go and you subscribe to something that has a diet plan and it is listing verbatim everything that you need to eat meal by meal, snack by snack, even right down to what it is that you should be drinking. If you don't like that stuff, I mean, how long are you possibly going to be able to stick with it? But in this case, if you don't like black beans, okay, go for white beans or kidney beans. It doesn't matter. Find the bean that works for you. And suddenly mm -hmm. everything starts working in your favor. I love that tip, mm -hmm. Steph. Yeah, no, that's, that's the one I, I pretty much give to everyone because people ask me, well, what's the best bean and or what what should I be eating? And I say, well, the best thing that's plant based that you should be eating is what you'll actually eat, what you like. They ask mm -hmm. me with milks all the time too. what what non dairy milk should I drink? And I say, well, try them all. Find the one you like and drink that one. Yeah. <laughs> so, Anyways, yeah. How do you uh, dress up the black beans for your kids to get them on board? Or do they just naturally like the taste of a plain old black bean? Or do you dress them up with some salsa? 
Oh, yeah. So we started off with actually blending the the black beans with some salt, some spices, and putting it on a corn tortilla and having them eat it almost. And then we bake it. So it kind of made, we called it bean pizzas, actually. And we would cut them up in pizza slices, the, the corn tortillas. And they started getting the flavor of black beans. And then as they started getting older, so now they're five and seven. And, you know, we always give them what we're eating, even if they only have one bite. We, we want to lead by example. So if we're having black beans, we would put it on their plate, but we didn't really force it. We say have one bite. And then eventually they started, they just started eating it. And we we got all excited. You know, we're like, Oh, you're strong. You're having your protein. You have your black beans and then we'll have corn. They do have salsa. My kids eat salsa and avocado on their bean pizza or in their tacos, but you know, it took time. So um, for anyone who has kids out there, who's like, kids eating beans, it does take a little bit, but if you keep putting it in front of them and not acting like it's weird and not acting that it doesn't, you know, saying that it tastes good and leading by example, they will eventually get on board. I mean, kids, kids are smart. You know, I can see somebody watching this right now who may have like a really stubborn husband who has his heels dug in and they're like, just no way I'm going for any of this plant-based nonsense. I wonder, Steph, if that same technique wouldn't work for somebody who's so stubborn like that. Yeah, you know, my my dad's not huge into beans, but he loves hummus. So when you blend white beans or when you blend black beans, it creates a hummus like like texture. And then you put that on in your tacos and you add all the fixins, right? And you're still getting the beans. They're just blended up. So it really, sometimes people do have a texture issue with beans. And then maybe you sprinkle a few in there and, and see how it goes. And just kind of, even with the husband, you know, you can, or, or a wife who's just not on board. You're like, these are healthy. We got to start transitioning. They're great for uh, fiber, phytonutrients, antioxidants, full of iron and calcium. So um you really do want, even if you don't like beans, you want to try. You want to keep keep trying that. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? Let's just make sure that that bean also tastes good. So when you're putting it on the plate, like, and mm -hmm. when they finally do get to sit down and they they finally put it on their fork and then lift it into their mouth, they're like, eh, this isn't half bad. Kind of mm -hmm. like a kid who refuses to ever eat a Brussels sprout, has to sit at the dinner table for hours after everybody mm -hmm. else has cleared their plate, but mom mm -hmm. and dad won't let them up until they eat that Brussels sprout. And when they finally do, eh, maybe it's not as bad as they thought it would be. Same mm -hmm. thing with the bean. Uh, mm -hmm. Number five, I love this one so much. D and D, done and dusted. Talk to us. Mm -hmm. Yes. So going back to people have different personalities. This is my husband. He, you know, he read Finding Ultra. He, he was the next day he was done. He's like, I'm getting all the meat out, you know, dusting off those, you know, off the cobwebs of, of the shelves because we're going to start putting beans in here. So done and dusted are the type of people who are, I'm on board, I'm ready. And I have tips for these people because as much as this is great, because you will get when you make dramatic changes, you will see more dramatic uh, ch changes in your blood work, in your health, right? So if you want, like, I need results now, done and dusted is probably for you because you, you know, as you take it all out all at once, your body is going to really respond. But um, it's not it's not for everyone. So that's why we have the other techniques. But if you do this, my number one tip is please eat enough calories. I cannot tell you. Um, how many people have come to me and they said, yes, I was on board. I gave up meat, but then I felt hungry all the time and I wasn't satiated and I was weak and I started getting tired and fatigued. And so I added some meat in and now I feel great again. And I, and I just kind of nod and I go, okay, well, what were you eating? What, you know, were you just, you know, ad adding another cucumber to your plate? You know, a lot of women have become a little bit carb phobic, you know, with the be staying away from rice, white rice, staying away from bread, staying away from those starchy vegetables. But then they find out, you know, they have high cholesterol. And so they reduce their meat and they're left with just fruits and vegetables. And then they're hungry all the time. So my number one thing is please eat enough calories. Please eat enough. Please start adding in the brown rice, your mashed potatoes, your baked potatoes, your squashes, your carrots, 
please eat enough calories or you will start feeling tired. You will start feel, feeling fatigued because you're just not getting all those calories in. So that's funny. Be, uh, when we do the, the live Q and A's on Wednesdays, we will get in the chat uh, quite often somebody who has just made that change themselves. And they're like, well, look, you know, I'm eating uh, all of these fruits, these vegetables that have fiber. I thought fiber was supposed to keep me full, but I'm still always hungry. And then when they add up the calories, they're like, oh, oh, I, I barely scratched a thousand today. So yeah. And that can be kind of a difficult thing, I think, for some people too, is to kind of find that balance, especially if their goal initially is weight loss, which is going to work mm -hmm. like a charm, right? Of course. But then, you know, long term, you don't want to, you know, risk not getting enough to eat. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How does one balance that? Yeah. I mean, really, if you're eating whole foods and you're not adding any, even the vegan like cheeses or vegan sour cream, those are going to be higher in fat and be higher in calories. So those are going to hold you back from losing weight. Your, you know, your health, your cholesterol will thank you because it's, there's no um, cholesterol in those products, but they're still saturated fat. So if, but if you're eating whole grain brown rice and baked potatoes, you know, with none of kind of the extra, you know, vegan cheeses or vegan sour cream, you will lose weight, but you'll also feel strong and you'll feel healthy about it. And it, yes, it might be slower, but as a dietitian, we recommend one to two pounds a week for healthy, sustainable weight loss. Any more than that, you're really dipping into your stores and you're going to feel fatigued or you're going to relapse completely. You know, you're going to go through three weeks, lose a bunch of weight, but then your body's going to be so broken down that you're going to wake up with, you know, a cheeseburger on your face. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I, I get, man, the relapse. That's real. That is a real, real, real thing right there. Mm -hmm. Sustainability is key. It kind of goes back mm -hmm. to also what we were talking about earlier and find what works for you. Um, that's another thing that'll keep you from relapsing. I want to go back to uh, tip number three, which was the fadeaway. And you were talking mm -hmm. about bringing your own food to uh, a party or a get together, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. It kind of, I feel like when somebody is just getting going with that, it can actually be a little bit intimidating to do that because you don't want to be viewed as an outsider at this party who brings mm -hmm. their own weird food to it. Mm -hmm. How did you deal with that kind of social pressure? Yes. So I think finding kind of those recipes that are, you could say crowd pleasers, if to go back to um, some sports analogies and bringing those, you know, I love the corn bean salad. It's corn red onions, red uh, bell peppers, uh, tomatoes, and black beans. And that is a crowd pleaser wherever you go. And it's very easy to go with a barbecue or with something dressed up. So I bring something that I know I like. You know, you don't want to bring, you know, a, a, a weird kale salad that you don't even like eating or it's not your favorite. And then you're stuck really sitting there wringing your hands, you're hungry, you're looking, you're looking at the food, you're looking at the food. You want to bring something that's filling. Um, you know, just ask the the host, say, hey, I would love to bring something, you know, or can I bring a side dish? I've actually even brought um like a like a, a bean patty. If we're barbecuing out and I kind of know the crowd, you know, and I don't really want to make a scene, I don't want to be that extra, you know, that kind of person who even asks the host, sometimes I will just bring it and whoever's on the grill, I say, Hey, can you put this one on for me? You know, and, and it usually is not a problem at all. I've even brought for my kids, I've brought uh, the tofu hot dogs that look just like regular hot dogs. I'm, I'm telling you, and um, I'll put it on, I'll take it to the grill and it's not even, not even an issue. So it definitely is tricky. You don't want to be that outsider. You don't want to be making anybody else feel bad about what they're eating. But you also need to think about your own goals and what is important in your life. And and if you if people are asking you, then sure, you can talk about it. But you don't ever have to bring it up. And just when I go to a party, I just skip over everything I can eat. I make sure there's something I can. So if I have to bring something, I do. Um, so it, um, it it is a little bit tricky, but you can definitely work around it. Yeah, I think that that's that's really, really, really good advice. Um, and also what I found what worked for me initially uh, was just try not to overthink it. 
you know, if you just do it and you don't make a big deal out of it yourself, uh, a lot of people aren't even going to pick up on what's happening there. So like it's it's kind of to borrow a line from Shakespeare, much ado about nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, if you build it up to be this big thing, it's a big thing. But if it's mm -hmm. all cool, it's just you're doing it and you're just doing it. No big deal. Although you're absolutely right, though, about the corn and black bean salad. I mean, I have been eating that even when I was at my heaviest, I would eat that because it tastes so doggone good. So when you use that term crowd pleaser, I'm like, she is absolutely right there, my friends. I bring it to every event. I'm telling you, everyone loves it. And you can eat it with chips, which kind of has that comfort food level to it. You know, it's not, you know, the best food out there, but it is plant-based. So you can bring the chips to get the low sodium and, you know, people will go to town on that. Spot on. Uh, baked. Uh, or traditional low sodium? Well, I look for baked. If I can get them, I'll get them. Yeah. If not, you know, if I'm going to a party, I'll just grab, I try my best to get low sodium. But even if I don't, you know, I'll, I'll bring it. You yeah. know, I do the best. I mean, that's, I say this to everyone about really any diet changes, like do the best you can with what you have. Yeah. So if you go to the store and you can't find it, okay, there, there are some chips that are plant-based that maybe they're not low sodium, maybe they're not baked, but you know, you're going to bring them next time. I will look for that. Or at home, I actually make my own. I take corn tortillas and I just cut them like in pizza slices and put them in the air fryer, bake them and they crisp up and they taste, they taste just like a, a regular chip. And all it is is a corn tortilla. So that's an option when I'm at home. Um, so yeah, see, that's, that's, that's really good too. Um, I can't speak on behalf of the organization here. I'm just speaking as me. I think that, you know, you, you can also introduce people to the idea of eating healthier. If that requires a low sodium Tostito, then so be it, right? They're still getting the corn and the black beans and all of that good stuff that they're dipping in it. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and certainly no meat, no sour cream, no dairy in there. That's, that's a huge, huge, huge victory, but then you can for yourself, bring your own tortilla chips as well, mm -hmm. or just save those for home, whatever the case may be, do it up uh, your style. But either way, it's it's a big step in the right direction. Um, we only have about three minutes left here. I want to talk about something else that you're busily working on at the Physicians Committee, and that is, well, believe it or not, we're already getting ready to uh, review the dietary guidelines once again. This is every five years, and we're about to be in the throes of it. Uh, I know that you are working with a team that's really putting some stuff together to see if we can make even more progress the next time these things come out. What are you guys working on? So the dietary guidelines are very, very important. I cannot stress this enough, how, how much the trickle down effect of the dietary guidelines. First of all, every doctor, you know, they don't get nutrition education. So where do they look when, when, a, when someone asks them, what should I feed my kids? Or what, when someone asks them, what do I eat to be healthy? They're looking at the dietary guidelines, right? Every community health program you know, a YMCA that's putting together a, a blood pressure course or a school that's a health teacher, where are they getting their gut? You know, where are they getting their nutrition ed education? It is from the dietary guidelines. The dietary guidelines also dictate the menus of the national school lunch program of the WIC packages, the women, infant and children, the snap food packages. So really what your child is being fed every day at school goes back to the dietary guidelines. And even dietitians will take a lot of our education and our promotion um, from the dietary guidelines. And so really taking the time and the effort, and this is why PCRM has, um, where I really wanted to work for PCRM is because they do take the time. We are trying to get to the uh, improvements in the dietary guidelines. So what we're doing right now is we're, we're we're going to set up a few events. We're getting kind of a coalition together of people who as well want changes to this guideline. So what do we want to see? We want to see de-emphasizing uh, de meat and dairy. Because right now we see that meat and dairy contribute to a lot of our chronic diseases. So you look at the American Heart Association and they recommend reducing your saturated fat. Well, what are the top five sources of saturated fat in the American diet? It's beef, cheese, milk dairy, eggs. So 
why are they being emphasized on the dietary guidelines if they're also contributing to chronic disease? So what we want to see is kind of de-emphasizing meat and dairy and really emphasizing those foods that actually are beneficial for heart disease, which is our number one killer in the United States right now. Um, one out of four adults die of heart disease. So what what are the foods that actually help heart disease? So that's your beans, that's your whole grains, that's your fruits and vegetables. So we really want to see those being promoted and emphasized and having them be showcased as the main source of protein. And then, you know, meat is an option, but, you know, it comes with baggage. It comes with an increase of kidney disease, um, inflammation, type two diabetes and heart disease. Man, you got your hands right. full. Um, <laughs> really quickly here, I mean, I just I look to our neighbors to the north in Canada. You were talking about de-emphasizing meat and dairy. I mean, they basically have completely de-emphasized dairy in their dietary guidelines. Is it too much to hope for that in the U.S. here, the next update to the dietary guidelines will have that type of de-emphasis? Well, we would love to see that. I mean, 65% of the country cannot digest lactose, which is in dairy. So it is when we want to be a very inclusive country, but our dietary guidelines say that you should be drinking milk three times a day and over half uh, of individuals get an upset stomach from that. We really need to take that into account from a, uh, from a, equity stance, but also from health. I mean, if you think about it, milk is a high calorie drink. Milk is for baby cows to become big cows, you know, and Americans don't have an issue with consuming enough calories, right? We have, we do consume too many calories. So why are we being told to drink this high calorie drink three times a day? The Canadian guidelines have actually taken dairy out of the requirement and have, and has water there instead. And they really de-emphasize me and, and are trying to open up people's minds and recipes and menus to including a lot more plant proteins. There you go. Man, I can't wait to have you back on. This has been a, a blast. Like this half hour just absolutely flew by. Steph McBurnett, you are a treat, a breath of fresh air, and I look forward to more great advice and sports analogies in yes. the future. I don't know where they come from. They're just rolling off the tongue here. I don't know, but it works. It absolutely works. We will talk to you again soon. Thank you. If your health IQ is a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.